Well, good afternoon and welcome to our first session of Going Deeper in the Word. My name is John Holiday and I'm pastor of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Old Japan, New Jersey. Delighted that you can be here over cyberspace for this first of four sessions of discussing the, the Christian mystic uh, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection in his book, the practice of the presence of God. I'm going to move behind the podium here, trying to work out all the technical issues here in our gathering here for today. Downstairs in the space for coffee fellowship this afternoon, trying a new space and hoping that the uh, monitor is coming through uh, somewhat clearly for you to follow along. Um, Again, the, the book is The Practice of the Presence of God. It is a free download at the iTunes store. Um, if, if you have an iPad or an iPhone, that's how I did it. I've got my iPad here and I read it on my iPad. It actually is a nice device for getting some written materials into our hands and it was free. It was not something that you got charged for. So I invite you to consider doing that or to to look at Barnes and Noble or Amazon or the local library to see if they have a copy of the practice of the presence of God. If not, I will talk about it and it is here up here on the screen and we can kind of go from there. But to get started here this afternoon, as is our custom, I'd like to invite you to join me in those seven cleansing breaths to be present here and now because here and now is a good place to be, the sacrament of the present moment. So please join me now in those seven cleansing breaths. Thank you so very much. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, friends and faith, would you join me now in a word of prayer? And then we're going to get into our discussion of Brother Lawrence for this week. Let us pray. Loving Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for this season of new life and resurrection that we call Easter. Alleluia, O Lord our God, you have indeed been raised from the dead. And we thank you for all the ways that the glorious fruits of new life and resurrection continue to come to us each and every day. We thank you at this time for this opportunity to gather and to consider the words and work of your servant, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. Thank you for his inspired words and for the message of wisdom that you have for us through what he has entrusted into our care. We ask that your Holy Spirit would guide our discussions as we consider these words and look for ways that they may have an impact in our lives, in our call from you to be your disciples here and now for the good of the world. For all these things, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in your holy and life-giving name. Amen. We have a participant here, also in person. Welcome, welcome to you, Anne. Please feel free. To, you can, you can know, you can take a seat wherever you would like. We've got participants here in person. We've got participants online, and we are just getting started here with this consideration of the practice of the presence of God. Trying to get the right camera angles. This is the first time that we're meeting here downstairs, and again, welcome to you as well, and so glad that you could be here Outside, with us today. At the top, so I had to repark. Oh, sorry about that. So the back is the better place if you happen to come here in person in any of the weeks in the future. So why Brother Lawrence and why this book? Well, it, it all started 
um, for me in in my in my childhood, actually, my my dad, who was a deeply spiritual person, would make comments to me from time to time about Brother Lawrence. What about Brother Lawrence? He said that Brother Lawrence said that even if you pick up something as simple as a stick, you should do it to the glory of God. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that, that kind of stuck with me, and Dad would mention it from time to time, but I didn't know much about Brother Lawrence other than that. And I was talking to Doris Bauman uh, a several weeks ago, actually probably a month or two ago, and, and we were talking about our survival strategies here during the pandemic. And I was mentioning to her that I had spent a lot of this time in books and particularly studying and reading about the Christian mystics. Well, when Doris heard this, she said to me, have you ever read Brother Lawrence? And I said, no, I haven't, but my dad used to talk about him all the time. Should I read him? And, and she encouraged me to do it. She said many years ago in the Bronx, she was in a Lutheran congregation, and, and a pastor by the name of Pastor Walker, I don't know what his first name is, he had led a study in that congregation, and Doris had participated in it, and she said that it basically changed her life. She said that it was an extremely meaningful book for her. Um, so I see that my screen is having some problems there. I will, I will fix that in a moment. Um, all the technical glitches here in trying to get everything up and running as it should be. And we'll get that back. In our practice of the presence of God, God also works through the technology when it works. <laughs> and when it doesn't work, it can be a little frustrating. Um, let's see if I hit OK again. It says that it should be working. Let me just stop this for a second. It works so well in the trial, but this is a new setting. All right, I'm having some difficulties with getting that to, to come back. I don't know what happened. Anywho. I'll just, I'll continue to talk and I'll be reading. So if you do have a copy of the practice of the presence of God at home, um, you can follow along on your own. Um, but but I said, Doris Bauman had mentioned it to me. She said, it's a short book, Pastor. I said, I read very slowly, no fears. You can get through it in no time. And, and actually I, I did get through it in, in no time, but it's broken up into nice, small, little bite-sized morsels that I kind of used as a daily devotion. And, and that I found to be quite helpful in, in starting my day, considering God's word as shared with us through the writings of Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. Now, now this, this does not represent Brother Lawrence's memoirs per se. He didn't write this down himself. It was after his life that a gentleman by the name of Father Joseph D. Um, Beaufort, D. Beaufort, he actually got permission from his church hierarchs or higher ups that he could write down these sayings of Brother Lawrence and, and gather together whatever letters that he had of Brother Lawrence and put them together into a book so that we could all benefit from these words of inspired wisdom. Um, so, so thank you to Father Joseph de Beaufort for doing that. Um, Brother Lawrence actually wasn't always Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. That's the name that he took when he entered the monastery. But he was born in eastern France in the region of Lorraine. And he was known in real life back then as Nicholas Herman. Nicholas Herman was Brother Lawrence's God-given birth name. He grew up during the period of the Thirty Years' War, so it was a very difficult time in Europe when that violence was going on. And, and Brother Lawrence, when he was Nicholas Herman, actually served as a soldier in some of these battles and ended up being severely wounded to the point where he was not able then to walk. So after these battles, he became lame and 
and that really kind of put a, a major imposition on his life. Um, at the age of 26, he entered the Discalced Carmelite Order. Discalced, what was that word meaning? I looked it up and I, I found that it means without sandals. And I, I think perhaps maybe that's quite appropriate since Brother Lawrence was not able to walk, being that he is lame from that war injury. But this order that he joined was actually founded or started jointly by two people that you probably heard me talk about over the last few months, Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Avila, and St. John of the Cross, Spanish uh, Christian leaders and mystics. They had the vision from God to, to get this order started, and it is an order then that Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection entered into, based quite a bit on the practices of the Desert Fathers. Who were the Desert Fathers? Well, you may have heard of someone like St. Anthony. He was one of the most famous of the Desert Fathers. What had happened was in the fourth century when Christianity was becoming the state religion of the Roman Empire with Constantine and the Nicene Creed and that unification of the church, there were certain leaders within the church that were concerned that the true teachings of the church were not going to be as recognized and followed. So they chose to separate themselves from the, the cities, if you will, and, and now the state-run religion, and they went to the deserts to get back to the basics of faith and have this close relationship with God. I mean, this theme keeps repeating itself throughout history. Think, think even in the time of Jesus and John the Baptist, and you've heard some of the archaeological digs along the Dead Sea, the Essene community. They were ones that were engaged in all that ritual bathing, that they were another one of these reform movements. And of course, as Lutherans, we know all about reformed movements as well. So a little bit of the background behind what was going on with this order and the, the, or the reasons why Brother Lawrence became a part of it. Brother Lawrence was known for his obedience, his humility, and his concern for others. And these are some of the key themes that are going to come across in the readings as we take a look at them here in community. So we don't know a lot about Brother Lawrence, but we do have some inspired work here in this book to discuss and to reflect upon here in community. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through these chapters, these letters in, in kind of a Lexio Divina fashion. Um, you may have remembered a few months ago, I did a study on selective Psalms from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And I really consulted quite a bit the scholar Walter Brueggemann from the Reformed Church for guidance on those, those documents. In this study, we're just going to take a look at it almost like a, a Quaker meeting house approach that we, that we read the passages and we're seeking God's guidance as to what the deeper meaning might be. Alexio Divina, as the Spirit leads us, we will seek the wisdom of the Spirit in Brother Lawrence's words. So I've highlighted some passages as I have gone through this material that I'm going to raise up for our conversation today, and we will see where the Spirit leads us. Anne, did you have a question? No, no. Anne's good? It's all new to me. It's all, it's Brother Lawrence. Okay, so we're we're just getting started here. I'm going to try one more time to fix the screen, see if I can get this to work. If I turn it off and turn it back on again, it might help out. Again, Joseph, uh, Father Joseph de Beaufort was the one that has put this material together. Try the Apple TV over there. Uh, 
Alrighty, it's not going to cooperate with us for today. So I apologize for that. We'll see if we can't get it fixed for the next time. But anywho, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, what we're going to look at today are what would be referred to as conversations. And these are conversations, I believe, that Brother Lawrence had with various people. It might have even have been uh, Father Joseph de Beaufort himself. But, but um, what we have are um, words that were heard or assumed to have been said by Brother Lawrence about values that he thought were quite important in his relationship with God. So, Brother Lawrence, in, from his standpoint. Now, Father Joseph de Beaufort evidently said that the first time that he met or saw Brother Lawrence was on the 3rd of August in the year 1666. So you think about it, um, 17th century, uh, we're talking about a time, 1620 was the year that the pilgrims made it to the Mayflower, to um, Plymouth Rock, and all of that world history here. So, so um, Brother Lawrence is in that 17th century time period, living between the years 1614 and 1691. Anyway, um, he told uh, Father Joseph Beaufort, Brother Lawrence did, that at the age of 18, he had this very significant, um, almost vision from God. He, he felt as if he had received this message from God, that in the winter, seeing a tree stripped of its leaves and considering that within a little time, the leaves would be renewed. And after that, the flowers and the fruit appear, he received a high view of providence and power of God which has never since been effaced from his soul. I mean, I talked about it even a little bit in the preaching this past Sunday. We were talking about Jesus in chapter 15 of John's gospel. Jesus says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. And I talked about how there are times when the vines look pretty barren and, and dead, but then in a few weeks in God's time, at the right time, the fruit begins to come forth. I mean, I was thinking about the trees and going for walks at uh, Tallman State Park, not too far away from the church here, and just enjoying the beauty of creation throughout the seasons of the year. That's been another strategy that I've been using to kind of keep sane during this period of the pandemic. And the trees especially are so expressive. And just a few months ago, they were so bare, so barren, so, so dead-like. But Again, as I mentioned in the sermon on Sunday, look at them now. They are bursting with leaves and all of this wonderful color and also maybe not so wonderful for some of us, a lot of pollen. So our allergies are probably not as good as they should be right now. Um, I noticed that the drains are getting a little bit backed up with all the tree droppings that are coming down onto the roof. So there's some cleaning that I'm gonna need to do in a, in a little while here, very shortly, to, to get this stuff out of the way. But the point being is, is that Brother Lawrence, through the gift of faith, was able to see these signs as the power of God to generate new life and resurrection in places that were deathly, where there was no life, where there did not seem to be any hope. And that stayed with him seeing something extraordinary in the ordinary. I mean, we go through uh, the seasonal changes for how many years and, and think nothing of it, but Brother Lawrence in, in this inspired moment was able to see this as a personal sign from God about God's power to bring forth new life in all of our situations here on this side of eternity. So that, that is kind of a key theme here, that Brother Lawrence is looking for the extraordinary in the ordinary. He being a mystic Christian, trying to recalibrate his heart in order to be aware of the subtle, wonderful, loving messages that God sends to us on a regular basis. To appreciate the abundant grace that is all around us that we may overlook or undervalue. So Brother Lawrence 
basically emphasizes that we should establish ourselves in a sense of God's presence by continually conversing with him. I mean, he was always looking for opportunities to pray. I mean, this is not original either. Think of our brother in Christ, St. Paul. St. Paul says in, I think, his letter to the Thessalonians, the Christians at Thessaloniki in that Greek city-state, pray without ceasing, constantly conversing with God. I mean, it's kind of, again, where I've emphasized focusing on the breath. That's something as simple as breathing. We remember, again, that it is God who first breathed in to the human being, to animate us, to fill us with his spirit, to fill us with the spirit of life, that we look for all kinds of opportunities to be aware of God's presence and to establish this conversation on a continued basis. Brother Lawrence says that we ought to give ourselves up to God with regard both to things temporal and things spiritual, and to seek our satisfaction only in the fulfilling of his will, whether he lead us by suffering or by consolation, for all would lie equal to a soul truly resigned. What's that prayer petition in the prayer that Jesus our Lord taught us to say? Thy will be done. So Brother Lawrence, following in the teachings of Jesus, is saying, look to have God's will done in all things, whether it's a moment of joy, whether it's a moment of pain, that we are able to see beyond whatever the initial experience is in the moment to the presence of God helping, sustaining, and loving us at all times. Brother Lawrence has suggested that to arrive at such a resignation as God requires, we should watch attentively over all the passions which mingle as well in spiritual things as in those of a grosser nature, that God would give light concerning those passions to those who truly desire to serve him. So those things that we love to do, are they idols or are they opportunities for us to give thanks and praise to the great gift giver who has given to us these things that we enjoy and experience? Brother Lawrence seems to be following in the footsteps of St. Augustine here when Augustine says the problem is that too often we enjoy the things of creation and we use the creator when we should be enjoying the creator as we use the things of creation. A little bit of a, a slight difference a little subtle difference, but it makes all the difference in the world when we get the right order with that. We enjoy the creator who gives us all things in creation to use. We look beyond the experiences, the stuff of life, and beyond all of this, we find the loving creator. Indeed, we are immersed, surrounded by God's loving grace. I'm now, if you're following along in a book, if you have one, I'm actually on the second conversation that Brother Lawrence had with, it looks like, Father Joseph de Beaufort. And this is what he says here at the beginning of this second conversation. He says that he had always been governed by love without selfish views, and that having resolved to make the love of God the end of all his actions, he had found reasons to be well satisfied with his method, that he was pleased when he could take up a straw from the ground for the love of God, seeking him only and nothing else, not even his gifts. It's not about the stuff we get from God, it's about God himself. And, and did you pick this up here in my introduction about what my dad said about just even picking up a stick to the glory of God? I think that this is what my dad had reference to that Brother Lawrence was pleased when he could take up a straw from the ground for the love of God, seeking him only and nothing else, not even his gifts. Again, we wish to be in relationship with the Creator. We wish to see the presence of the Creator and all the good gifts that surround us. Remember that Christian hymn, 
all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above, then thank the Lord. Oh, thank the Lord for all of his love. Boy, Brother Lawrence could have made that hymn or written that hymn. Highlighting again here in conversation number two, Brother Lawrence says that we ought to act with God in the greatest simplicity, the greatest simplicity. You know, sometimes that's easier said than done. Think, for example, about the prayer of quiet that we've talked about. I don't know if Brother Lawrence practiced this prayer of quiet or the centering prayer that I've talked about at times that has been kind of lifted up by St. Teresa of Avila and, and someone like Thomas Keating or John Main, some of these Christian mystics throughout the centuries. But, but it is a simple prayer that, that, you, that you sit quietly, still, for a period of time. You know, what could be easier than that? But yet that which is simple is not always easy now, isn't it? to sit quietly for 25 minutes without moving, that takes some getting used to, um, I know from personal experience. But it goes again to the point of simplicity leads to an awareness of God. Sometimes less is more. I've heard that in architecture, I've heard that in design, but also perhaps in the spiritual life, less is more. Simple solitude, stillness, and silence that leads to this awareness, this appreciation of God's presence in our lives. Brother Lawrence continues here that in his trouble of mind, he had consulted nobody but knowing only by the light of faith that God was present, he connected himself with directing all of his actions to God. For example, doing them with a desire to please God. Let what would come of it. That useless thoughts spoil all, that the mischief began there, but that we ought to reject them as soon as we perceive their impertinence to the matter in hand or our salvation and return to our communion with God. Ooh, useless thoughts. I, I remember in, in Buddhist thoughts, somewhere talking about, I've heard this concept of, of monkey minds. When, when our minds are racing, um, do you ever go for a walk and your mind is just like racing in all kinds of different directions, all kinds of different places, um, and, and, and we're working ourselves up over, over things that in some ways we don't have any control over. We're just kind of like a hamster on a wheel, spinning round and round and round and round. Um, evidently, Brother Lawrence is, is knowing some of these practices. I mean that when our minds are racing for no particular reason, we're not even able to turn it over to God in prayer. That's what Brother Lawrence is basically saying or encouraging us to do. If, if we're able to continue to have communion with God, something's on our mind. We're trying to be still. We're trying to be in the simplicity of the moment. Things, thoughts are coming to our mind, random thoughts that maybe are not helpful, maybe that trouble us. Are they thoughts that we can actually do something about? Or are there ideas that maybe just need to be handed over to God in prayer as, as an offering? Brother Lawrence is inviting and encouraging us to have this emptying of our minds so that our minds can be filled with the presence and the spirit of God. Brother Lawrence goes on a little further here, that all bodily mortifications and other exercises are useless except as they serve to arrive at the union with God by love. That he had well considered this and found it the shortest way to go straight to God by a continued exercise of love and doing all things for God's sake. So how do we think on God at all times or be aware of God as often as possible? Brother Lawrence doesn't say it literally here, but quoting from Thomas Merton, that Thomas Merton, another Christian mystic from the 20th century, was suggesting that it's hard to think on God all the time, but the best that we can do is we can think on love all the time. What is the most 
loving thing that we can do in any given set of circumstances? What is the most life-giving thing that we can do in any given set of circumstances? Yeah, if please God more. Bingo, exactly, because God is love and God is life. So therefore, if we're able to be engaged, embraced, and immersed in, in love and life-giving activities, then we are thinking on God, whether we are actually aware and conscious of it in the moment or not. God's presence is being known in our lives. So again, it is all about delighting in God in all things, seeking in love to know God's presence. Conversation number three, if you're following along in the book, is where I'm at now, where Brother Lawrence quoting here from the writing. Brother Lawrence evident, evidently said, um, told Father de Beaufort that uh, the foundation of the spiritual life in him had been a high notion and esteem of God in faith, which when he had once well conceived, he had no other care at first, but faithfully to reject every other thought that he might perform all of his actions for the love of God. So that again, it is it is this understanding of God in faith. We, we know that we, are, we walk by faith, but not by sight. Uh, again, faith, I heard this defined the other day by one of um, um, a writer that, that I like very much, um, a, a retired psychiatrist by the name of Jim fin Finley. He's a psychologist or a psychiatrist. He was in therapy anyway. But he says that faith is... A, an obscure certainty, an obscure certainty that, that we have this understanding of the presence of God that, that, is, that is beyond our ability to fully articulate. Um, I know it, I know it, I know that I know it. The problem is, is, it is that I who know it. And when I try to tell you what it is that I know, I don't know what to say. It's beyond words, that God is always beyond words to fully share and, and to, to um, communicate. But yet when we are talking about these things in community, as Jesus the Word wants us to be in community, we, we kind of like strengthen each other's faith because we say, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I know of this obscure certainty of the presence of God that, that I can't measure, that I can't objectively quantify I mean, for me as a recovering business person who likes to measure everything, this, this is a tough concept. Um, but, but we know ourselves that love is real. Love is a real force. But how do you measure love? <laughs> I mean, really, it, it, it can't, you can't get at your ruler. You can't get at your yardstick. You can't calibrate in a, in a laboratory the presence of love. But yet we know it to be real. And so it is with God, too. I mean, God is, is beyond our ability to comprehend, beyond our ability to, to, to articulate in, in the limits of human language. But yet we know this to be real. We know this to be real. Brother Lawrence goes on a little bit further here that the, that the worst that could happen to him was to lose that sense of God which he had enjoyed so long, but that the goodness of God assured them, assured him that he would not forsake him utterly and that he would give him strength to bear whatever evil he permitted to happen to him and therefore that he feared nothing and had no occasion to consult with anybody about his state. So Brother Lawrence here apparently feared the absence of God. Deus abstandicus, butchering the Latin a little bit there, that, that God is, where are you, Lord? I feel like you are not here for me. That, that he, he had that fear. You, you can't ever leave me, God. You'll never abandon me, right? Well, somehow he got the assurance in his prayer life, his spiritual life, that God, God convinced him and assured him, no, my child, I will never leave you. I am here for you always. I am with you. I mean, if we think about the Gospel of Matthew, too, chapter 28, 
verse 20, very end of the gospel. Jesus says to all of his followers, and remember, I am with you always until the end of time. That is the experience of Emmanuel, that is God with us. And Brother Lawrence, in his constant attempts to have this awareness of the presence of God, received this assurance of God's presence, constant presence in his life, that no, my child, I will never leave you, abandon you, or forsake you. I am with you always, forever and ever. And what a relief that is. And, and if, if we ever get a, afraid that God is not here, or God is not present, or God is not with us, that we can call on God and say, God, I need you. Please don't ever abandon me. Give me a sign, Lord, that you are here and present with me. You know, I don't have to be able to share it with anyone else, but if you can just let me know so that I understand, I would be grateful. Taking it to the Lord in prayer, constantly taking it to the Lord in prayer. That is what Brother Lawrence is encouraging all of us who follow in his train to do. That many, Brother Lawrence, more Brother Lawrence's words as reflected by Joseph, Father Joseph de Beaufort here, um, that many do not advance in the Christian progress because they stick in penances and particular exercises while they neglect the love of God, which is the end. Mm. Penances and particular exercises. It's, I think it's another way of saying going through the motions rather than, and, and you know, when you think about what Jesus had a, a problem with too, when he was about his earthly ministry, he was concerned with religious leaders of his day going through the motions, practicing the letter of the law without the spirit of the law. And what is the spirit of the law here? According to Jesus, according to Brother Lawrence, it's, it's love. It's love. Love is at the heart of the law. So that, so that when we neglect the love of God, no wonder we may have some difficulty. No wonder we may have some challenges in, in experiencing God's presence on a regular basis. It's, it is all about love. It is, it is practicing the presence of God by focusing on love, by focusing on love. Brother Lawrence says here also that there needed neither art nor science for going to God, but only a heart resolutely determined to apply itself to nothing but God or for his sake and to love him only. So, so again, um, it's a simple way to pray. It is a simple way to be. We, we don't need any advanced schooling or, or um, highfalutin approaches. Um, again, science. Science is a gift from God. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the gift of science. I, I believe that science is a gift from God that tells us how things work. But another gift from God Theology, if you will, the study of God, theos, the Greek word for God, ology is word or study of, study of God, that theology answers the question of who, who is responsible for all that we see. Science and theology work hand in hand. But Brother Lawrence is saying that we don't need a lot of science or art to know the experience of God. It can be a very simple experience of God in love that is the best way to know God. It's not that God can't be known in science and in art. I mean, who among us hasn't seen a beautiful piece of artwork and thought, praise to you, O Lord Jesus Christ. This is incredible. This is gorgeous. Think of the writings of, of the, the great Lutheran musician, J.S. Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach. At the end of all of his pieces, he says in Latin, to God alone be the glory. Yo-Yo Ma was supposedly hearing Johann Sebastian Bach's work and thought, who is this God that has inspired such lovely work? And it became a piece of uh, a tool for evangelism in, in that light. So, so it's not that things like science, I mean, you, you look out in outer space or at the, uh, 
you know, the expanding of the universe and, and how magnificent and marvelous everything is, or the details at the cellular level of what goes on in life and, and those, those intricate little nuances of, of life that we can't see with the naked eye, but through science, we can see it with a microscope and other high powered magnification tools. Um, you know, these, these are gifts of God, but they are not necessary for the experience of God. It isn't that God can't be experienced here in some ways at times. Again, we enjoy the things of create, we, we, we use the things of creation, get it right here. I'm gonna, I don't wanna misquote Augustine. We enjoy God, the creator, as we use the things of creation to get to the point where we enjoy God. So, so again, um, maybe I too am making things a little bit too complicated here, that focus on God and rest in God's presence with us always and forever. I'm moving on now to the fourth conversation that Father Joseph de Beaufort recorded that, that he remembered about Brother Lawrence and Quoting here, Father de Beaufort says that Brother Lawrence's prayer was nothing else but a sense of the presence of God, his soul being at that time insensible to everything but divine love, and that when the appointed times of prayer were passed, he found no difference because he still continued with God. So, so it sounds to me as if Brother Lawrence, because of his times of prayer, because he had this discipline, I guess, of the language that I've used as putting ourselves in the place of least resistance for God to work on us and reach us, that it became almost a habitual Christ consciousness, that, that his prayer life, his, his, his disciplined prayer life, flooded over, it flowed over into the other parts of his day, that the awareness of God's presence became more constant throughout the days. That's a gift to have that constant Christ consciousness, that habitual awareness of the presence of the infinite loving God constantly and always working and pouring his grace-filled love into our lives. And that we ought once for all heartily to put our whole trust in God and make a total surrender of ourselves to God, secure that God would not deceive us, that we ought not to weary of doing little things for the love of God, who regards not the greatness of the work but the love with which it is performed. Again, back to this idea and understanding of love, simplicity and love, the humility, emptying ourselves so that we can be filled with the presence and the love of God. Think again of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, a 20th century saint, Actually, she lived, I guess, into the 21st century. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah I think so. So she'd be 20th and 21st century saint here. Um, I remember I've, I've quoted her a few times over the years in sermons that she evidently said, I can do no great things. I can only do small things with great love. She sounds like she was a student of Brother Lawrence here as well. Again, the importance of simple acts of love, that if the acts are done in love, then they are done with great effect. The whole substance of religion, continuing here in this conversation number four in the book, The Practice of the Presence of God, the whole substance of religion was faith, hope, and charity. What's another name for charity? Love, of course. Kind of quoting from, from our brother in Christ, St. Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Remember what he said. And, uh, and uh, among these, these three remain, faith, hope, and the greatest of these is love. So here we go. 
by the practice of which we become united to the will of God, that all besides is indifferent and to be used as a means that we may arrive at our end and be swallowed up therein by faith and charity. That all things are possible to him who believes, that they are less difficult to him who hopes, that they are more easy to him who loves, and still more easy to him who perseveres in the practice of these three virtues. Now, a few years ago, I kind of got in the practice in our worship life here at Prince of Peace during the prayers of the church of, of specifically asking God to continue to bless us with these spiritual gifts of faith, hope, and love. And my oh my, here we go, that it seems like Brother Lawrence also, among others, St. Paul was the first, but Brother Lawrence here too, is encouraging us in these wonderful spiritual gifts of faith, hope, and love. That again, as the saying goes, that faith changes, I've got to see it to believe it, into I've got to believe it to see it. That faith is the lens that enables us to see the fingerprints of God and his love all over everything. It is what I sometimes like to refer to as the x-ray vision of the gospel, that God is hidden in plain sight in, in many ways. Um, and, and love is the key in helping us to experience and to have those aha moments in faith where we can say, aha, there you are, God. I see you there subtly at work, doing your loving work behind the scenes as well as in plain sight. And this habitual sense of God, that is what the goal is here, that, that more and more over time, as we are focused on this practice of the presence of God in whatever way is that works for us, um, that we, we get more and more a, a constant Christ consciousness, a, this habitual sense of God. You know, one method may work for some people, one method may work for another person. I know, for example, that that 20th century mystic, uh, the Christian um, Thomas Merton, was not big on methods. He he doesn't necessarily say like Thomas Keating that that centering prayer, um, the prayer of quiet, is the way to go. Um, you may be more so encouraged by going for nice leisurely walks to no place in particular or or listening to beautiful music or, or looking at artwork um, you know in a museum these quiet contemplative spaces tending the roses in the backyard doing some gardening working in the earth um, we are all created in different ways by this abundantly loving creator what ways work best for us. Go with it. Follow your heart on that. And let God, who lives in our hearts, lead you in love. So that there is this more and more Christ consciousness, a habitual sense of the presence of God in all things, all of our days is quoted here again in conversation number four, um, that he had this, this, this filial trust in God. O oh my God, since thou art with me and I must now in obedience to thy commands apply my mind to these outward things, I beseech thee to grant me the grace to continue in thy presence and to this end do thou prosper me with thy assistance, receive all my works and possess all my affections. So, so, here in this prayer that Brother Lawrence is, is offering that was quoted here in conversation number four in his book, um, again, that in all of our activities, Brother, Brother Lawrence spent a lot of time in, in the kitchen, it, and it didn't always go so well for him in the kitchen. He, he kind of was in some ways all thumbs and would make mistakes, but he's praying to God that, that in all of his activities, in all of his endeavors, that somehow God's purposes might be served. There was a time also where he was, he was charged with 
the activity of making sandals. I mean, in some ways that might've been tough because remember we talked about how he suffered that injury during the 30 years war and he was lame, but yet he was here called and charged with making sandals for others. How can God's will be served in all of these activities? That is what Brother Lawrence is encouraging here that in his prayer life, that prayer life that is breaking in more and more to all of his waking days, this, this awareness of God's presence, that it is filtering into all of his activities in daily life so that there is a strong sense that God's will is being done and God's purposes are being served in the activities that we may, in other instances, consider to be mundane or ordinary. God is using them to do extraordinary work. I think of it in terms from our Lutheran tradition of Luther talking about ministry in daily life and that the humble activity of daily life serves God's good purposes, such as changing the diapers of a baby or putting your children to bed or, or making, making dinner for the family or what have you, that it can all be done to the glory of God. And more and more having an awareness that a good and loving God who gives us life is at work inspiring these activities and looking over us and smiling at us. Thus said Brother Lawrence, by rising after my falls and by frequently renewed acts of faith and love, I am come to a state wherein it would be as difficult for me to not think of God as it was at first to accustom myself to it. Wow. Think about that. We always are trying to think of God and, and, and think on God and know God and seek his presence in our lives. And, and we have to work at it. We have to use all this effort at it. And here, apparently, Brother Lawrence, after all this time, it's just natural for him. That how can I not think of God in all things? It, it's become as, as familiar to me as breathing again, as breathing. So to be blessed to just have it be second nature, that we are aware that God is with us and constantly looking out for us, guarding our path forward and covering our back and walking by our side as our best friend that we will ever have. Wow, what a wonderful gift that truly is. Something worth seeking after, I believe. Brother Lawrence would certainly we encourage us on that path. While several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were upon my knees at the blessed sacrament. So, so right here, Brother Lawrence is also, also suggesting that the acts of worship that we do as we kneel before Christ's holy presence in, with, and under the bread and the wine, there at his table as his honored guests, that, that we are able to, to have that experience of being fed in faith by this sacred food to carry over into all of our table fellowship and all of our gatherings, that in all these experiences of life that God is able to feed us in this sacred way, that we have this awareness of, of life being filled with sacraments, ways that God is presenting and pouring his unconditional love and grace into our lives, that it is all connected in this great and marvelous unity. Wow, Brother Lawrence, you were a good guy. <laughs> yes, he's, he is definitely um, someone that I want to read a little bit more about. I hope you do too, because that's actually getting us to the end of the time that I had wanted to cover here. That was actually, if you get a copy of the book at some point in preparation for our time together next week, uh, we covered the first four conversations in the book. And next week, we're going to look at the letters that had been gathered. Brother Lawrence is 
guidance and communications with various people over the years about items that he thought were important that might be helpful to them as well in their spiritual life. And, and praise be to Jesus that, that they've been collected and they're here for our consideration hundreds of years after Brother Lawrence's life. So we'll start next week with the first of the letters, and I hope that we can cover four letters in our session next week as we continue to rejoice in the inspired work of this humble, simple servant of God who God used to do great things for the life of all of his disciples and his continuing church. So before we go, I'd like to thank you again for joining us, whether in person or through the gift of cyberspace. I'll review this video and try to get the video up here to work better for next time. Not sure what happened. Um, I apologize again for that. But um, thank you again for being here. And how about if we close our time together today by praying those words that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all so very much again for your presence here today. Go in peace, serve and love the Lord. Thanks be to God.